the honor of having Dr. Judith Engelman speak for us today. So I'm gonna give you a little background about Dr. Engelman and then I'll hand it off to her. So Dr. Engelman is a board certified psychiatrist who's practiced in Phoenix and Scottsdale for the last 38 years. She's currently a faculty member at Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine and Science and has previously taught at St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center and Barrow Neurological Institute and Maricopa Medical Center. Her extensive research experience includes being the director of neuropsychiatric research for both phase one and two, as well as phase two and four research, a uh, phase four research facility for five years. Dr. Engelman's recent research study at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale Department of Psychiatry and Arizona State University Department of Psychology is related to fostering re resilience in women healthcare professionals with children under the age of 18. She continues to work with Mayo Clinic practitioners and medical students in the areas of wellness and resilience. Dr. Engelman is passionate about supporting the utilization of genetics to develop more precise diagnoses and to personalize more effective treatments for mental health conditions. So we like to call Dr. Engelman an, an FOG, a friend of Genomine, and she's gonna spend the next uh, 45 minutes here talking a little bit about bipolar disorders. We'll try to leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&A but as I said earlier, use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you can enter questions at any point throughout the webinar, okay? So um, I'd like to present Dr. Judith Engelman. Dr. Engelman, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dow. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, I have a little cough. It's not COVID, fortunately. So um, we're gonna go through my slides, I'm gonna do presentation. I look forward to questions. And at the end, I'm gonna have a, just a quick case presentation to kind of pull things together. So we are talking about a fantastic topic that really affects us all, bipolar disorder. So let's get started. A lot of famous people have had bipolar disorder in the present as well as the past. And here are some of them. And here is, we're going to discuss today these topics, so epidemiology and suicide risk. We'll briefly go over the diagnostic criteria. You can look those up yourselves. Evaluation, diagnosis, treatment, and we're going to talk about future directions, which are very exciting, so much research. So what is bipolar disorder? Well, bipolar disorder is a complex illness. It's an affective illness, and it has lots of different components, mood disturbance, neuropsychological deficits, it affects immunological and physiological changes, disturbances in function. The most important thing is it is one of the leading causes of disability worldwide, and it's associated with high rates of premature mortality, both from suicide and comorbid um, medical problems. Up Here's a key point, up to 50% of patients finally uh, have been diagnosed with unipolar depression, and they're now recognized to be suffering from bipolar spectrum disorder. So this diagnosis is missed. I'm sorry to say I missed it a lot in the early days of practice, and only 20% of patients are correctly diagnosed within one year of having symptoms. Usually there's a five to 10 year delay in diagnosis, critical and often mistreatment. And most patients have seen four clinicians before they receive an accurate diagnosis. The course of bipolar disorder, it's a lifelong chronic illness. And usually there are far more, as you can see from this slide, there are far more depressive episodes than there are manic episodes. The episodes get closer uh, with fewer times of remission in between. And usually the first presentation is depression, which makes it difficult to diagnose. And often that depression is mistreated, treated as unipolar polar depression with, with an antidepressant, which can set people up for rapid cycling. Here you see the intervals between the first, there's usually a longer interval before the second. And as you can see, the intervals shorten between recurrences as time goes on. Kreplin, Emil Kreplin was 
a physician who diagnosed this early and some of the early work in 1921 was pivotal in starting to elucidate this illness. Now let's talk about the epidemiology and suicide risk. So here you see, these are the two emotions, the main emotions. I'm so great, I am so great. And that the withdrawal, sleeping, isolating. Okay, so the most important thing about epidemiology is family history. <clears throat> if someone doesn't have a family history of a mood disorder, bipolar disorder, even schizophrenia, it's very unlikely that this is their diagnosis. So you have to ask about family history. Prevalence, one to 3%, one to 4%, and it's equal male to female. This illness has an early age of onset. So if somebody has their first depression at 18 or younger, or their first um, episode of depression that later leads to bipolar two disorder by 20, it's most likely that they have a bipolar diagnosis rather than a unipolar depression. And formal, formal and molecular genetic studies have demonstrated that this is a multifactorial disease. It's not one gene, it's many. And you also always with psychiatric illness, but especially with this illness, you have to look at genetic as well as epigenetic environmental factors. Um, so 40% of these patients, when I talk about family history, 40% uh, from major depression, they have a lifetime risk of a first degree relative who has a mental illness, who has a mood disorder. So it's seven times higher in the, pop, in the bipolar population than the population at large. Another important factor that affects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is childhood abuse. We now know that prognostically a history of childhood abuse is really affects the course of mental illness. And it really sets people up if they have a genetic predisposition to having bipolar disorder really sets them up to start having episodes. Again, just a slide to illustrate different psychiatric illnesses, but look at the far end on the right, the heritability with bipolar disorder. It's the most inherited psychiatric diagnosis we have. Again, famous people have had it. Vincent Van Gogh, was diagnosed with all of these illnesses. But if you look, and he had bipolar disorder, but if you look at his family history, you see what we see with a lot of folks with bipolar disorder. You can see his siblings that had not only bipolar disorder, but they had suicides, they had recurrent depressive illnesses, and they had unspecified psychosis. And we now know that the difference between we used to have distinct diagnoses, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but now we see that these are spectrum illnesses and they're genetically much more associated with each other than we used to think. The most important thing to consider with bipolar disorder is the rates of suicide. And here you see them. The highest risk group, white males over 60 whose suicide rate is over two times the population. But as you look, 25 to 50% of these people will attempt suicide and 15 to 20% will succeed. So bipolar episodes are truly psychiatric emergencies. So if you can see that this with adolescence, it is, well, late adolescence, 15 to 34, it is the second highest cause of death. Um, and you can see that of course, substance abuse can contribute mightily. It's one of the things that concerns me about the legalization of marijuana in so many states. Marijuana can be very helpful for all kinds of things, CBD, THC, 
but I have seen an inordinate number of patients who had their first episode at a young age because they were smoking a lot of dope. So we have to really educate our youth about the risks in a forming brain of using marijuana and certainly taking drugs because it can unmask a, di a bipolar diathesis. And again, and the main risk factors for suicide, of course, are a history of attempted suicide, substance abuse, and hopelessness. These are some of the factors that contribute to suicide risk. These are well documented in various things. But you can see one of the things I want to highlight is anxiety disorders drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Very often the symptom of anxiety with bipolar disorder is underappreciated. Hence the use of serotypine uh, with bipolar disorder as well as sometimes in the early treatment of mania or depression, benzodiazepines to help with the anxiety. And of course the antipsychotics because anxiety is often one of the symptoms that leads to disability as well as suicide. Family history of suicide, critical to ask about, and it's amazing how often you'll hear about a family history of suicide. Also histories of previous generations where there were hospitalizations, where ECT was get, given. It was that strange relative that people talked about. Comorbidity is the rule with bipolar disorder, it is not the exception. There are many psychiatric illnesses that are comorbid, as well as medical illnesses that you see along with bipolar disorder. You frequently see migraine, thyroid disease, obesity, type two diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Now you see these as a consequence of treatment, but you also see them independently. Morbidity and mortality, these people often die young between 10 and 35 years younger than their expected life expectancy. And you can see some of the morbidity, all kinds of things are associated with this. What isn't on this list but needs to be added is COVID. There's so many psychiatric sequelae to COVID, new onset psychosis, as well as depression, of course, and we see depression as an epidemic during this pandemic, as well as suicide and substance abuse. So let's talk about briefly about the diagnostic criteria because you can look this up in the DSM-5. This is what it looks like. So when you think of bipolar disorder, think of this diagram, because if you see in the manic phase, sure enough, somebody is I, and we see people come in dressed with lots of different clothes and makeup and the onset again before the age of 30, elevated mood, irritab irritability to think about bipolar disorder with excess excessive irritability along with the mood disorder and the um, variations of, of manic and depressive periods. Speech, you see all kinds of things depending on the degree of mania, for example, clanging, vulgar speech. Sometimes these people really know how to, how to get you. They're <clears throat> very incisive and intuitive. Uh, weight, with mania, you can see weight loss because they're going a mile a minute, grandiosity, delusions, a decreased need for sleep, one of the most sensitive things to get in history, and a flight of ideas. And their mood suddenly escalates less for a week. And again, here are some of the different symptoms that you see with depression and their classic for major depressive episodes, but they're bipolar episodes. I'm just gonna go through this quickly. You can look up the slides, but as you can see, you have to have at least, for bipolar one, you have to have at least one manic episode. And this can have psychotic features or a hospitalization. You have to have an impairment this is a main criteria, marked impairment, social or occupational functioning, 
or necessitates hospitalization to prevent harm to your to the patient or someone else it has to last at least a week and there are three of four major criteria and if mood is only irritable then it has to be four in other words if it's not pure mania and again you can see the the various symptoms that you can look up and the mood dis disorder um, is not attributed to substance abuse, though, as I said, substance abuse is a frequent comorbidity. Again, these are, if you look at bipolar depression and you look at major depression criteria, you'll see that they're basically the same. Uh, the difference with bipolar depression is you often see hypersomnia and hyperphagia, these people can gain a lot of weight and they sleep more generally and you get reverse diurnal variation. So the best part of the day is often the morning, it gets worse as the day goes on in contrast to major depressive disorder. And you can see again, unipolar depression has one additional criteria as opposed to bipolar de depression, but it's a critical criteria, which is with unipolar depression, there has never been a manic or hypomanic episode. Okay, so bipolar two, again with bipolar one has to last a week. With bipolar two, you have to have at least four consecutive days of persistently increased activity or energy. That's with the hypomanic phase, okay, four consecutive days. Same with the symptoms and with hypomania, very similar to mania only. The episodes are less dramatic. You don't have psychosis. You often don't have hospitalization. So here are the, uh, just a quick outline of the differences in bipolar one, bipolar 2, and cyclothymia, which is alternating between hypomanic symptoms and mild or moderate depression. But again, you can get these don't ever increase so that they're actually a full hypomanic episode lasting four days, as well as a full depression with the degree of depressive symptoms and suicidality that you usually see in bipolar two or bipolar one. So let's talk about the evaluation. I think screeners are extremely important in diagnosing all psychiatric illnesses for all kinds of things. The white box for OCD, Hamilton depression rating scale, the adult ADHD scale, and with bipolar disorder, the second one, the rapid mood sc screener, it is rapid. I'll show it to you in the next slide, but it's critical and it brings out the symptoms very quickly. So I often will administer these tests before I see a patient so that we have them by the time I do the evaluation. And again, the young Mania scale is very important. The PHQ-9, this is a, a nine question, part of the patient health questionnaire. And again, it can reveal depression very well. And it's very important to give these people the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. I did a lot of research on depression. Some of the studies uh, that are actually in my, in my research are, are highlighted in this presentation. But one of the important things that we gave all our patients was the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Often things will come out in these scales that don't come out in your interview. Patients are more likely to admit and rate symptoms like suicidal ideation or wishing that they would not wake up, wishing they weren't alive, than telling you in person. And so I like to use screeners. And I also like to use these screening questionnaires along the course of treatment and watch how they change. That's especially true with attention deficit disorder, which gives specific target symptoms so you can see how your drugs are working. Here's the rapid mood 
screener and you can see the questions and they're both for hypomania as and, and mania as well as depression uh, so here's the more talkative uh, and here's here's one that goes with depressive symptoms so it's a quick it's only six questions and it could be life-saving so other aspects of bipolar evaluation so I have highlighted in red, it's a busy slide, but I have the most important things that you want to look at. It is very important in psychiatric evaluations to get, and especially bipolar disorder, to get, if you can, collateral information from family, friends, or past medical records. I've done a lot of inpatient medicine, emergency and in psychiatric inpatient medicine, as well as committee people and very often going through their chart, having the historian who brings them in or contacting family members is critical to really understand what the patient has and also identify the longitudinal course of what the patient has. So you really want to identify if the patient has had suicide attempts because we know that with each subsequent suicide attempt, the risk of completing suicide goes up of course, you want to look for comorbidities, including attention deficit, which can be a difficult differential in young people with bipolar disorder. They can actually have attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity or excitability or impulsiveness, which can confound somewhat unless you really get into teasing out the difference with bipolar disorder in a young person. So you'll always want to screen for drugs and alcohol abuse. And certain drugs can mimic a manic episode uh, or precipitate a depressed episode. So you always, always, always want to screen. You also want to look at laboratory tests because there are metabolic syndromes such as hyperthyroidism that can mimic bipolar disorder and again, emphasize always look for drugs, urine toxicology, screen for substance abuse. The risk of violence, we need to take that seriously because if you look up to 50% of healthcare providers are victims of violence sometimes during their career. I've had two episodes, one specifically when I was at risk, real risk for violence. So you always have to be mindful. Sometimes it's easy when you've been doing this for a long time to get a little lazy, but patients are unpredictable. So you have to look at such things in your office as well as in inpatient settings, because you hear tragically about uh, practitioners who are murdered by patients who have bipolar disorder as well as schizophrenia. So you really want to look for these behaviors, provocative behaviors, angry demeanor, loud, aggressive speech, tense posturing, changing body positions, aggressive acts, throwing. So when you're doing evaluations of these people, especially inpatient, be mindful of these things. Have someone else in the room. Don't make the mistake I once made when I was a resident of putting the patient between the door and you. So you always want to have access to the door so you can get out, but so they can get out too if they're escalating and make sure you have a panic button in the room if you are seeing a patient in an acute setting. So the differential diagnosis is especially important. Again, psychiatric illnesses, functional uh, psychiatric illnesses can be confounded with bipolar disorder. Infectious illnesses can be confounded. Uh, encephalopathies, uh, you can have uh, infections like uh, uh, COVID, for example, is frequently confounded. Lyme disease, neurologic symptoms, strokes, trauma, vascular disease, of course, drugs, which I've met, mentioned, metabolic uh, disorders. You can have hypernatremia, hyponatremia, and endocrine disorders, such as hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Here are the psychiatric 
considerations when you have someone with bipolar disorder or symptoms of bipolar disorder, and I've mentioned some of these. Sometimes the differential with schizoaffective disorder is difficult, but if someone has a low-grade psychosis and they don't have inter-episodes periods of complete remission, you might start thinking about schizoaffective disorder. So, and with kids who have oppositional defiant disorder, start thinking about bipolar disorder, especially if there's a family history. Again, drugs of abuse. Here's a list of drugs that can mimic, mimic or precipitate a bipolar disorder. And some prescribed drugs, of course, can precipitate symptoms. So if you look at the lifetime prevalence with bipolar disorder of using alcohol, for example, you can see that the highest of all the psychiatric diagnoses, the highest uh, uh, percentage of patients who consume alcohol is with bipolar 1 disorder, which incidentally 90% of suicide attempts and overdoses have alcohol on board. And countless times in the psychiatric emergency room, I, I saw people come in uh, inebriated, intoxicated with high blood levels of alcohol and they were suicidal or homicidal. And once they cleared, they no longer have those symptoms. Let's talk about treatment now. So the goal of treatment is mood stabilization, as you can see, and I showed many artists, uh, people in theater have bipolar disorder. Uh, and again, look at this painting, crazy, and her comment is more lithium. So the treatment principles, pharmacotherapy is the mainstay of treatment, and it is a chronic brain disease. So early and consistent treatment certainly affects the disease course. You want to educate patients as well as their family, especially their family, that this is a chronic disease and they can look at things such as medication, lifestyle, diet can be very important. Circadian rhythm management, especially because the early onset of a manic episode can be a decreased need for sleep. So I always ask my patients about sleep. And I try to point to out if they have insight, if they have bipolar chill, if and to family members, watch for sleep and avoiding holidays. And don't take med holidays. It's different than with attention deficit disorder, which I think should be treated even on the weekends, but it's different. Sometimes kids or adults with that will take a drug holiday. Not so with bipolar disorder. People need to get on a maintenance treatment and remain on maintenance treatment unless it's a first episode and you're they've been on treatment for say a year and you gently titrate them off not in october not in april which are the highest suicide months of the year uh, but then in the summer uh, you can titrate them off and see how they do after a year of treatment so here again are what you're looking for with uh, diagnoses. So um, similar approaches, principles are uh, assess the patient, the goals, drug classes. So these are all things that you need to be aware of, uh, comorbidities when you're making the diagnosis. Let's talk for a minute about, um, let's go back here. Let's talk about lithium. Lithium has been the mainstay and was discovered by McCabe uh, and uh, people were going and taking the lithium salts in, in treatment centers or in spas in Europe long before this was formally diagnosed and sure enough, their symptoms got better. So it has been used to treat bipolar disorder for 15 years. Again, you can look up the details about how to prescribe lithium and about what to watch for with lithium. In acute mania, this is what you're going for. You're going for a window between point eight and 1.5, which is on the high side, but sometimes you need it with mania. 
and for maintenance that decreases. You have to be aware of what other medicines you're giving along with lithium and you can have side effects, which can be very unpleasant. But I know a lot of people who have been on lithium for 25 years and done great. Sometimes uh, about a quarter of people on lithium, uh, no, it's not that high, but a large percentage will develop hypothyroidism. So you have to constantly measure thyroid. They can also develop a, a concentrating problems in the tubules in the kidney. So you want to look for, you can have polyuria and you can have some kidney disease that develops. So you want to follow BUN, creatinine. However, that being said, those are not necessarily reasons to discontinue lithium. I had a patient two years ago who was in the hospital who would have breakthrough and her doctor had taken her off 150 milligrams of lithium because she had some kidney failure and she got psychotic. So even with kidney failure, we watched her lapse, but we put her back on the 150 milligrams because every time she went off, she had a manic episode. So you can judiciously use lithium. But again, you have to watch for lithium toxicity. And if you have other choices in treating a manic episode in someone who has kidney disease, you want to use those other choices because of the potential for kidney failure. And you should always get blood levels. So be aware of lithium toxicity, especially when patients are dehydrated, they have an illness, they're hiking high altitudes, you can see lithium toxicity. So here are the treatments for bipolar mania. Okay, so there have been lots of studies to analyze what works. And very often when somebody is acutely manic, we need to use a combination of treatments. So lithium or proA with or carbamazepine plus an antipsychotic and improvement studies, and here's the study I'm reference, referencing, have been greater with combination therapy than monotherapy in bipolar mania. Antipsychotics are the mainstay, and you can see a list of the different antipsychotics. There are some new antipsychotics that have come out. Um, this is uh, the about uh, I can't remember the name, but I have it in the next slide, but a new combination of olanzapine and semidorphin, which is an opioid antagonist. Um, so there are some exciting drugs that have come out. Um, if lithium plus an antipsychotic does not work or there's a contraindication such as kidney disease, you can use valproate or vice versa. Be mindful with valproate, as well as these psychiatric drugs in women of childbearing age because of the risk of teratogenicity. Okay, so um, let's see. This is the drug, it's Libalpi, and it was FDA approved, I believe, last this year, last year. And it's a combination drug for bipolar 1 disorder. And it's exciting because olanzapine is a fabulous drug for bipolar mania. However, the weight gain is prohibitive. I did a study in adolescents with using lithium or valproate with, uh, in, with olanzapine and we measured waist circumference. And as you can imagine, it increased constantly and early. So weight gain with olanzapine is a real problem, though it is often my go-to drug. And here's the study that compared this, uh, the combination of olanzapine and samidorphin, which incidentally you don't want to use with opioids because samidorphin is an opioid antagonist like, like naltrexone, so it can precipitate withdrawal. But as you can see at 24 weeks, 29.8% of patients who received the lansipine exhibited weight gain of 10% or higher versus 17% um, uh, who received left LA. So the percent of change in weight 
uh, 6.6 .6 for olanzapine alone as well as and it was versus much less weight gain 4.2 percent so also uh lethality is associated with smaller waist circumference uh, which is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. However, surprisingly, that change in waist circumference did not correlate with the metabolic aspects and the lipid changes that you see just with olanzapine alone. And there's some speculation that olanzapine alone predisposes people to have metabolic syndrome. But this was a, a, not a huge study, and so that needs to be further studied. So with agitation of mania, you have to determine the cause of the agitation, whether it's just the mania or it's caused by something else. I once admitted a 66-year-old woman who had new onset mania, very unusual, no family history, no previous history. This woman, as it turns out, she had hypoxemia. And so that was causing her mania. It was an unusual presentation. We have to think about all these things. And if somebody is acutely agitated and they're in the hospital, very often we have to give them an inhaled form, an oral form, an intramuscular form, or we have to give them uh, a melt form, something that goes under the tongue to reduce agitation. And unfortunately, sometimes they have to be put in restraints and secluded. But benzodiazepines can be excellent for adjunct treatment, even in an IM preparation. And also, if you have to give something like aripiprazole or haloperidol to elicit uh, a reduction in agitation with the patient, you can include a benzodiazepine, like one or two milligrams of lorazepam. It decreases the likelihood of akathisia, which can be agitating and very upsetting for patients and look for all the world like a manic episode or precipitate more manic symptoms. So that combination can be excellent and I give it frequently in the acute setting. I also use lorazepam and clonazepam for sleep for the first week because these people need to sleep. That alone is very reparative. So first line treatments, for hypomania and mild to moderate mania, you can use risperidone, olanzapine, and here's a list of uh, reasonable alternative choices. Uh, uh, Cariprazine, uh, brand name is Raylar, has been added to the armamentarium, excellent drug, less weight gain, along with Zepraxanthem than some of the other antipsychotics. So um, if People don't get a response to an adequate trial on three to five anti uh, three to five monotherapy trials with an antipsychotic. Then you can go to the combination of lithium and valproate. So you can see some of the algorithm of treatment, and there's excellent algorithms out there. I particularly like CanMat, which is the Canadian uh, treatment. Uh, from mood disorders that came out in 2018. I think the ones from the APA are in the early 2000s or 2013. So they're not as updated as the Canadian algorithm, which again, I like. So clonazepam, lorazepam are not drugs. Benzos are not drugs that you want to use on a long-term basis with bipolar disorder because of the risks of substance abuse, unless somebody has catatonia, which for which those can be a treatment of choice. So if you have bipolar depression, again, has been very difficult to treat in the past. It's exciting because there are new drugs that have been FDA approved for the treatment. So when I put this as the treatment for now, but I wrote this, uh, I updated this talk last year for my students at Mayo Clinic Medical School. I just updated it this week because new drugs are coming on uh, out for bipolar depression all the time because it's really been difficult to treat. If somebody is rapidly depressed and uh, with bipolar disorder at a high risk for suicide, you don't have time 
for the drugs to work or drug trials, and they've been on several things in the past. ECT is certainly a vital alternative as a first choice for those particular patients. If not, you can use mo uh, monotherapy with any of these drugs. Lumetepirin, Caplida was recently in December 20th, I think of 2021, approved for the treatment of bipolar one and two depression. So that's an exciting new drug. And lorazepam and lumetepron have less weight gain, especially lumetepron. So again, depression is more frequent. And here to note are only, there's only five drugs, five antipsychotics, which are FDA approved for bipolar depression. And here's what they are. Olanzapine is uh, approved with fluoxetine. That's a combination called Symbiax. And I have peas for um, uh, children. For It's approved in pediatrics for the drugs that have been FDA approved. And again, here are the three that are associated with less weight gain. And again, with, with treating bipolar depression, and generally bipolar one and bipolar two depressions are treated the same with the exception of some antidepressants in bipolar two, which I'll get to. But combination <clears throat> therapy, um, antidepressants are not effective and are not to be used in bi treating bipolar depression. And again, lubinteperon, the only drug that's approved for treatment of depression in both bipolar one and bipolar two. Here are some of the second line treatments, which again, I would refer you to the CANMAT, uh, the Canadian study, the, uh, the CANMAT criteria for first and second line drugs. And again, for treatment refractory, as well as the use in urgent situation for treatment refractory patients, ECT is certainly a good choice, especially in older people who are not eating or catatonic. Here are things not recommended for acute bipolar. Here are piprazol monotherapy and lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is frequently given with folic acid, but folic acid actually antagonizes the antipsychotics through various me uh, mechanisms. So folic acid interferes with efficacy. Treatment of bipolar resistant. Here are some of the choices. You can uh, look at the medicines that have been used for excessive sleep disorder. Actually, they can be helpful medicines for restless leg. IV ketamine, not FDA approved, but can be life-saving. Unfortunately, it doesn't last so long and you can have recurrence uh, at day 19 or as early as day 10. Superphysiologic doses of lipothyrox and T4. And in fact, the PET scan changes in the brain in areas like the amygdala, prefrontal cortex, uh, hippocampus have actually correlated with decreases in depression symptoms. There's research on anti inflammatory agents. I have seen people who respond to nothing else respond to vagal nerve stim stimulation dramatically, and it is FDA approved. And I frequently use light therapy uh, with depression. Uh, there's another treatment that has been very successful, which is using orange glasses at night with people who have mania, which uh, protects against the blue lights. And so those people with the orange glasses can actually have a good result and start sleeping better. So rapid cycling, we have to really think about using antidepressants in the first episode of depression because uh, it might be bipolar depression and tricyclics are notorious for creating rapid cycling and uh, to trigger uh, uh, episodes, first line medications, quetiapine, and again, for treatment resistant patients, lamotrigine, refractory patients, T4, and don't forget clozapine for bipolar disorder. It's more complicated to prescribe. It requires registration uh, for you as well as blood levels to look for a granulocytosis, but a very, very effective drug, drug that's probably 
underutilized. I want to mention lamotrigine, which is a drug I love because it can be used for both bipolar one depression, often in combination with other drugs, as well as bipolar two. And lamotrigine can be both the mood stabilizer, protective against bipolar uh, two uh, depression, and it can be used very effectively with the antidepressants in bipolar two. Speaking of which, this is something you need to look at when we consider antidepressants in bipolar disorder. We don't use them in bipolar one, mixed features, these various things. But here is something that might encourage you to use antidepressants uh, in bipolar two if you have some of these and you don't have rapid cycling, you haven't had recent hypomanic or manic episodes, and also getting into pharmacogenetics and some of the value of using pharmacogenetic testing. And incidentally, I have tried them all, and I've come back to Genomite because of the rigorous research with Genomite's testing, as well as the drug interaction checker, which I love. And of course, it you can look at the um, SLC6A4 serotonin receptors, and you can see that um, if somebody has the short arms, it discourages antidepressant. Um, but if they have the long arm of the genes of the alleles, you can consider antidepressants. So again, previous, uh, these are meta-analyses, these are studies that support the use of antidepressants in bipolar disorder, an excellent study that looked at switch rates and found that there was no difference in using lithium alone or sertraline in switch rates. They were the same. So in combination, um, uh, actually was worse than either of the antidepressant or lithium alone. Psychosocial factors, this again was, uh, this was a treatment review for the uh, uh, US Department of um, Health and Human Services. And the key about this is that basically there is not evidence that it's rigorous, that it's conclusive for any of these uh, treatments, including psychoeducation, CBT, collaborative studies, TMS, um, partner interventions. So unfortunately, these studies are not well controlled. They're not well crafted. The criteria vary. You're not sure who's in it. But there is one uh, psychosocial uh, intervention, which is step uh, in the step bipolar study, and three different modalities were tested, and the rates of recovery were significantly higher in the groups that received intensive psychotherapy and a greater proportion of those who received family therapy recovered and they had the shortest time to remission. So the old adage that you don't need to use intensive psychotherapy in folks with bipolar disorder is not actually true. It can be very effective, especially when families involved. Let's talk briefly about future directions. Again, we're talking about genetic testing. And I think this is funny, went in for a simple blood test and got cloned by mistake. So translational, research bipolar disorder, we're understanding the neurobiologic basis and biomarkers which help us with early detection. And specifically, this was a study that looked at lots and lots of cases and compared and found 30 loci with 20 new ones that achieved significant genomic association evidence. So we're starting to narrow down what might some of the genes be that help us identify who has a bipolar diaphysis. I specifically want to mention on three as well as CACNA1C, which are two genes which are on the genomite panel. And those are highly correlated with bipolar disorder. But it's important to know that now, as I spoke about the spectrum disorders, type one bipolar is genetically highly correlated with schizophrenia, but type two is more correlated with major depression. Again, bipolar and genetic studies. This is a huge study genome-wide 
Association study, huge study, and again, it looked at these various things, and it saw that certain three uh, SNPs, single, nu uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs like chromosomes 3 and 10, were associated with all five of these disorders. So it's not so cut and dried as we used to think. So So I'm going to, um, again, some markers, BDNF, again, which is also on the genome panel. So TACNA, uh, and I want to skip, okay, I want to skip to uh, <laughs> bipolar means waking up, not knowing whether Tigger or IE or will be making your decision that day. So I want to end this show. And they want to bring up one last thing. I know we're running a little bit late and questions are important, but I want to show you the application of one of my patients who I was treating. This woman was 33 years old. She'd had a history of major depressive disorder, they thought, that was treated with an SSRI to which she didn't respond. She came in to me wanting uh, to, she was 33. She wanted to get pregnant. She, her treatment had not responded. She'd had episodes and on questioning, careful questioning, it appeared that she had a family history of bipolar disorder. She had mood instability and aunt, alcoholism, suicide attempt. So I decided to get genetic testing, pharmacogenomic testing with genomine to look and to see if I could identify what I thought was there, which was a predisposition to a mood disorder. Because I, she was on four different medicines. Polypharmacy is always, unfortunately, the name of the game in psychiatric disorders. But I wanted to get her off of those medicines because she wanted to get pregnant. And I wanted to get her on safe medicine. Sure enough, she had one of the S alleles, which indicates that she was less likely to respond to an SSRI, which was in fact the case. Looking at uh, MTHFR, which is an important enzyme in the metabolism of folic acid as it goes through to the neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. I love it when I see that somebody has a genetic abnormality <clears throat> or a SNP, it's not an abnormality, but it's polymorphism. In that particular uh, gene, one of the alleles, because I know I can prescribe virtually a vitamin L-methylfolate, and that will help their mood because they'll create more of those neurotransmitters. Sure enough, she had that. So in her prenatal vitamins, I had her use L-methylfolate instead of folic acid uh, in order to minimize the risk of uh, neurotube defects in the fetus. Another thing I was delighted to see in this patient was that she had one of the uh, SNPs in ONG3 that is suggestive of a mood disorder, as well as CACNA 1C. So that confirmed my hypothesis that she might have a mood disorder, which meant I could use lamotrigine probably effectively to mood stabilize as well as protect against bipolar 2 depression. And it is safe, safer than the antipsychotics and other drugs in pregnancy. One other thing I want to point out is her HLA status, um, which indicated that she was unlikely to have uh, a cutaneous serious adverse event if I put her on lamotrigine. So pharmacogenomic testing helps me so much. It's well validated. It's clearly better than treatment as usual. And I use it. I use it a lot. So let me go back and we can answer some questions. Okay, now that I'm unmuted, I'm back here. Thanks, Dr. Engelman, that was great. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, so one of the questions 
that was uh, added in here earlier was uh, had to do with uh, TSH levels. So do you continue lithium therapy if a patient's TSH decreases after you start lithium? If their TSH decreases or increases? <clears throat> uh, question <clears throat> says, yeah, question is TSH levels decrease after initiation of the treatment. I guess, I guess the question here is if, if lithium impacts um, thyroid yes. functioning immediately yes. upon presentation, what do you do about it? Yes. The reason I mentioned increase is because it's more frequent that people will have hypothyroidism uh, if they're on lithium therapy. Yes, I continue the treatment, but I try to diagnose what's the reason they have a decreased TSH or an increased TSH. Do they have primary hypothyroidism? Do they have Hashimoto's disease? Is it caused by thyroid? But I would certainly adjust, find the cause of the TSH change. I would treat it and I would keep them on lithium. Absolutely. You can treat hypothyroidism. Okay, great. Thank you. Good question. One of the questions we get a lot is, what do you do with the patient who has comorbid bipolar and ADHD, especially the pediatric patient. You know, how do you, um, what do you do for the differential diagnosis and, and kind of walk through your, your therapy? Okay. Great question. <clears throat> Difficult. I look at the family history. I look at specific symptoms. I look for uh, conduct disorder. I look for sleep changes. If there's frequent comorbidity, I think it's something like 30 or 40% comorbidity. And you can treat them both. And there are some good research studies that show that generally, if somebody is on a mood stabilizer, you can continue to treat the attention deficit disorder, especially e including stimulants, and you don't necessarily get a switch. So the fact that they have bipolar disorder, if they're adequately treated and they're on a mood stabilizer and <clears throat> uh, Respiridone, for example, as well as uh, Symbiax are approved for pediatrics. If they're on one of those drugs or a mood stabilizer or lithium, then I go ahead and use a stimulant if I need to. And if that's what improves, you can always stop it if you have to. But there are good studies that suggest that you can use both and treat it. And it's important to treat it. Thanks. That's an important question. Okay, one, um, one question about folic acid and bipolar one. So uh, can you explain how folic acid exacerbates bipolar one? I'm not, I'm, I think that was more related to lamotrigine, wasn't it? Um, well, folic acid, actually, if folic acid is used with lamotrigine, folic acid can counteract the efficacy of the antipsychotic if you're using combination therapy. So uh, by various mechanisms having to do with that pathway from folate down through methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, over to uh, the three neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, dopamine, and uh, serotonin. So folic acid uh, if you're using that combination to supplement with folic acid is probably not a good idea. Or if you do use something, L-methylfolate can be used. Thank you. Um, probably time for one more question and it happens to be the last question, it's a very specific one. So in vagus sustena, compare in vagus sustena versus um, oral daily for bipolar one disorder. Well, in, I like the sustainance, and I didn't mention, uh, which I really do want to mention, I'm glad for this question. I like the use of long-acting injectables as first-line treatments, both for schizophrenia as well as manic episodes in bipolar one. And the, the, the earlier that you use sustained medications, and again, we have medications that are good for uh, two to four weeks, as well as sustained medications that are now good for three to six months. And often you, in the hospital, you can start those medications or you start people on an oral dose and then 
convert, convert to an equivalent of the sustained release, uh, often continuing the oral dose until they get an adequate blood level, which varies depending on the sustained release of the drug. But long-acting antipsychotic injectables are need to be considered as a first-line drug because they've been used to punish people in the past and patients are resistant to taking shots. But if they know that they are going to not have to come back in the hospital and if they're not going to have to take medication every day and it dramatically reduces the risk of relapse. So that's something you want to work with the patient and the family and the practitioners want to educate patients about the use early. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're a few minutes past the hour. I think we're going to try to respect everyone's time here and wrap things up. Um, thank you, Dr. Engelman. Uh, we will be sending out a link to this presentation to everyone who is registered for this call. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get answered today, feel free to send an email to medicalaffairs at genamind.com and uh, we'll do our best to answer your question. If we can't answer it, we'll forward it along to Dr. Engelman here and, and uh, she can answer it for you. So. Again, Dr. Engelman, thanks for your time. This was fantastic and uh, hope to talk soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care.